my paper of choice is USA Today. So I managed to grab a copy of the December 29th issue. Front page headlines, and the headlines were, Road Weary Truckers Risk Lives on the Job. The subtitle was, Companies Often Force Their Drivers to Work Shifts with Little or No Sleep. I thought, man, this is right up my alley. I gotta sit down and read this. Uh, USA Today has done an, an investigative report on the port drivers out of LA and Long Beach and they've been tracking these guys. They've taken their trips and their timestamp logs and their timestamp paperwork in and out of the ports, traced them back four years and basically broken down their runs and compared them to the hours of service that were available for these port drivers. And in that four year period, they found 580,000 hours of service violations. These port guys had numerous accidents, some of them involving deaths, deaths of their drivers and deaths of other people, motorists or pedestrians. And basically it breaks it down to these port drivers are driving with not nearly enough sleep and they're killing themselves and they're killing others. Now, here's another quote that I found interesting. This is from one of the drivers. He says, there are some days you can't think right anymore because meaning they're so tired. You can't tell if you're driving or not. You just have to continue working. And that's one of the port drivers explaining to USA Today how tired they get sometimes. How are these trucking companies getting away with this? Well, they're not gonna get away with it any longer. USA Today has named names, named numerous carriers involved in this. Over the past decade, Many companies push drivers into debt by requiring them to buy trucks through company-sponsored lease-to-own programs. Drivers found themselves trapped in jobs that paid them pennies per hour after expenses. If they complained or refused to work long hours, they could be fired or lose their trucks along with the thousands paid towards its purchase. And what they're talking about there are the never-never plans that we've talked about, where the companies force these guys to lease trucks and become owner operators, then put them to work and put the squeeze on these guys. And that's, that's why these never, never plans ought to be illegal in my opinion. Now, if you have ever wondered how we got into the position where we're mandated into electronic logbooks, it's guys like these carriers that have put us in this position by forcing these guys to run until they're having wrecks. So, if you ever wondered why we've got these electronic logs, uh, bodies like the NTSB have looked at this situation and said, okay, you guys haven't been able to govern yourselves legally. So we're going to have to step in, mandate these electronic logs and force you guys into complying because we can't trust you to do it yourselves. And it's just a matter of greed plus desperation, greed on the part of these carriers to squeeze every last drop they can out of these drivers. And necessity on the part of these drivers and owner operators that have been forced to keep going because they need the money and they're afraid they'll lose their jobs or their trucks or their houses or lose everything because these carriers have just got them right under the thumb. So there's why now today we have electronic logbooks and there's thousands of stories just like this out there. Thought I'd tell you a little story. Back, oh, late 70s, early 80s, up in Canada, A-trains were legal and popular. And A-trains consisted of a big lead trailer, and behind that lead trailer, it pulled a small pup trailer with a, with a pindle hitch setup, like an A-frame pindle hitch setup. Very wobbly when you pulled them down the road. And we were running back then a lot of fuel in British Columbia. A couple of us ended up having to go down, and it was a regular route for us. We'd go to Trans Canada, just past Banff, and uh, cut down Highway 93. And what that did was run down through to Radium Hot Springs, through Kootenai National Park, hook into 95, and then carry on down south into Cranbrook, BC. And there were a couple of pretty good 8% long hills on that, on that grade, and there were BC runaway lanes on those grades. 
Now, a BC runaway lane doesn't consist of pea gravel the way it does in California or something like that. A runaway lane in BC is basically just a path carved up the side of an adjoining mountain just to cut through the trees that just kind of dead ends at the top. And the idea is on a California running lane, you kind of sink into this pea gravel and it stops the truck. In BC, you just kind of ride the truck to the top of the hill and then generally the truck starts to roll back down, it jackknifes, goes on its side and that prevents it from, hopefully prevents it from coming down back across the highway. God, God help you if you're on the highway when one of these things comes back down off the hill. But everybody that ran BC knew that the idea was if you had to use one of these runaway ramps, you waited until the momentum had stopped and then you hopped out of the truck before it took you backwards down the hill. So there was a guy working in our outfit that we all called Mikey and Mikey had gone down the hill too quickly and realized he was in trouble and the brakes were smoking and he was gaining speed and he realized he was in trouble. So at least he had the presence to go up one of these runaway lanes that was available to him. And he went down 93, shot up the runaway lane, waited till the truck ceased going forward. It was just getting ready to go back down the hill. Mikey jumped out of the truck. The truck started to roll back down the hill, started to jackknife and hooked a big tree in between the cab and the lead trailer and hung up on the side of the side of the hill up, well, I don't know, a couple hundred feet off the highway. And the whole truck just hung up there and it would have been great. There was no damage done except when Mikey jumped out of the truck, he broke his leg and his hip because he jumped out and landed on a rock. So he really didn't have to jump at all. The truck was hung up there in the hill and we ended up having to run oh hundreds of feet of hoses to pump it off but we pumped it all off broke it up into three pieces and winched it down off the side of the mountain but the the tragedy of it all was that that mikey broke his leg for nothing but god knows it could have been a lot worse it could have rolled backward burst into flames and burned a thousand acres in the kootenai national forest and it didn't do that so it wasn't a wasn't a total tragedy anyway it came off the worst of it was that mikey broke his leg but we kidded him for a long time after that about it that's why you've got to be safe. You don't want to have to hop out of the truck and break your leg. Be careful out there. I'll see you on the backhaul.